Acknowledge Tim Wilson, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, slash Freedom Commissioner. It's fantastic to have you along, especially bearing in mind that Tim Wilson was our special guest at My Choices original event down in Melbourne, which was actually, as I just found out, uh, on the day that the Australian High Court announced the constitutional validity of plain packaging. A very dark day in this nation's history and possibly in the world's history, given the way that it's spreading nuttily across countries and across industries, perhaps most horrifying. Um, so thank you everyone for gathering today to join in the fight against the nanny state and against terrible policies like plain packaging, uh, like the lockouts which we're going to hear about, and lifestyle taxation, the bane of many of the people in this room who I have noticed taking advantage of the fantastic smoking area at this excellent venue. Um, this would not be possible without the support of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, which we all know is a fantastic organisation. Uh, responsible for a significant amount of the improvement in liberty over the last couple of years since its inception, so give us lots of money. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we've got three fantastic speakers lined up for tonight. Uh, first we're going to hear from Cass Wilkinson, who we all know is a fantastic freedom fighter, slightly from the left, but we love her anyway. <laughs> Cass has done a lot of really fantastic work lately on the lockouts campaign in New South Wales, which we have all suffered from, uh, except for those of us who live in Newtown and Piermont and Double Bay, who yes. arguably are enjoying partying at home, although those who enjoy their quiet residential neighbourhoods may not feel the same, or those who actually derive their income from Sydney's nightlife probably feel very, very differently. Uh, we're also going to be hearing from Julie Novak, who is one of Australia's foremost liberty-minded tax minds. Um, I love listening to Julie, and I'm sure everyone has had the experience of, lis of, of listening to Julie. Um, and learning the most amazing things, the most amazing and horrifying things about Australia's taxation system and about the extent the government will go to to try to nudge you into doing exactly what they want. Uh, and finally, we're very lucky to have Chris Snowden with us tonight. Uh, Chris is joining us all the way from the, Indi the Institute of Economic Affairs sorry, in the UK, where Chris is the Director of Lifestyle Economics. Isn't that a fantastic job title? Um, Chris literally wrote the book on the nanny state. He is one of the finest minds in the world for investigating all the many and varied ways that the, uh, the state will try to nudge you into doing exactly what it wants, regardless of how you're interested in living your life. Uh, so thank you again for coming out tonight, and we'll start off with Cass. Thank you very much. Um, as to the left-wing thing, I often find myself um, having got uh, to become friends with many of you rampant capitalists because of my love of sex, drugs and rock and roll. I do find myself like Lara Bean Bingle wondering where the hell are you when I see my left wing friends. Um, there's an extent to which I, um, I don't understand how it is that the side of politics that we're supposed to be arguing for much greater social freedoms has wound up standing in many cases for this creeping public health movement. Um, and I was stunned recently being um, on a panel discussion with Tony Pulisic where we were asked, if you could save only one thing from the federal budget cuts, what would you save? And, you know, I probably would have saved the army. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, hospitals or something. But she said the National Preventative Health Authority. Shine. And I thought, you know, like, even I'm hearing the toss over whether there's a role for that. The one thing, the university funding cut, no, National Preventative Health, this is, that's what we're going to go with. Um, I got into the No Lockouts campaign with Laura, um, partly because I don't like bad things, but partly because um, I'm president of FBI Radio and we uh, own the FBI social venue in the heart of King's Cross. And when Thomas Kelly was assaulted at 10 p.m. outside on the street, that was a, a shocking and horrifying event um, which we nonetheless knew was going to be probably completely unrelated to anything that would happen to us afterwards. And we held a forum at our venue, co-hosted with Time Out, um, where essentially we begged everyone to have the courage to do nothing at that point because since 2007 in New South Wales we've had immense restrictions placed on alcohol service. Um, if you want to get a scotch on the rocks in this town after midnight, you are out of luck, foreign visitors. Um, you can't do that. It's called a shot, uh, which is binge drinking. And you certainly can't buy one for your new friends who you happen to have met while you're out having a nice time because that's, uh, that's binge drinking as well. So 
we've been through a phase of having to pay more money for more staff, um, having to sell less alcohol, and as I tried to explain on the night, um, we can't play new bands that hardly anyone's ever heard of who bring hardly any beer drinkers to our venue if we can't even sell the beers and if we have to stop serving alcohol before we stop serving customers then in actual fact in the music industry really alcohol is the currency of the music industry in this city. And there are places where that's not the case, they don't have the property prices that Sydney has. Um, you know, we were, I guess, lulled into a false sense of security because up until December last year, Barry O'Farrell did this completely wonderful thing where he respected the facts and he was tweeting, because he was cool like that, um, the Boxar figures showing that since the RSA changes in 2007, which had ratcheted up costs for everyone in the industry and had contributed in no small way to several closures, um, in fact, the crime rates across the state, everywhere that it applied, had been coming down. And so since 2007, street crime, alcohol-related violence, physical assaults had all been trending down. Somewhere over Christmas, the robertson Bernie opposition kept hectoring O'Farrell, and at a point in January that no one was expecting, he suddenly lost his spine and flipped and decided that we were immediately going to have 1.30 lockouts and 3.30, no service of alcohol. Um, to which the police commissioner helpfully said, well, there's no reason that anyone needs to be out after 1 a.m. <laughs> and well, of course there's no reason you need to be out after 1 a.m. There's no reason you need to have more than one pair of shoes. But is it really anyone's <laughs> business if you decide to live a rich and interesting and happy life by staying out long after you have any good reason to be out, making new friends that you didn't already have and having new fun that you hadn't already had? And while it's become commonplace and almost expected now to say we only encourage responsible drinking. I like irresponsible drinking, I do, but I agree with Martin Amos that, you know, if I host a party, I expect people to have at least as many drinks as they need to be entertaining to my other guests. <laughs> if everybody stays stone cold sober, it's kind of rude. People walk around, I don't find that amusing. Well, if you had six more beers, you probably would. That guy does, and that guy's laughing his ass off. So to be serious for just a moment, well, I'm totally on board with the get out of my life argument for not doing it. There are a couple of other reasons for not doing it. One is that the clubs who play live local music in this town make no money from it. And by and large, they run a disco afterwards um, where they play music out of the machine to pay for the music that comes out of musicians. So if you can't run a long night from 10 till 5 a.m., then you can't have two phases over the evening and you can't cross-subsidise your local music with your piped music. Um, it also means that session musicians are not able to do second and third shifts during the night. I know a lot of DJs who've lost their 2am shifts, which even if Andrew Scipioni thinks they should all be home in bed, 2am DJ shifts were bread and butter work in this town up until the lockouts happened, and now they've been lost. The small clubs are losing market share to large clubs because if you're going to be locked inside after a certain point in time, most people prefer to be locked inside a five floor venue with three different dance floors and four different bars than to be locked inside a small club that has one stage and you don't know what the next band is like and maybe you won't like them. Troublingly, although I'm not anti-gambling by any measure, a lot of clubs are moving, losing market share to the casino who have inexplicably been given an exemption from the lockout laws. So given that if drugs are bad, okay, and alcohol is bad, okay, then surely gambling is worse, okay, and sending all of the kids down to the marquee bar doesn't seem to me to be the best possible thing to do with a bunch of young, impressionable 20-year-olds who could be happily getting sloshed. It could go instead. Um, then, finally, the illegal party scene has come back. Parnell was reminding me, for those of us old enough to remember them, that the illegal warehouse parties were pretty awesome. But what they didn't have was a lot of fire and life safety. What they didn't have were many people who were ambulance trained in case you had an overdose somewhere. Um, and they certainly didn't have any RSA training. So you are pushing people, surprise, surprise, the effects of prohibition are to create an underground illegal market in the things that you try to outlaw. And 
surprise, surprise, we have displacement effects so that neighbourhoods like Double Bay and Newtown are now complaining that there's far too much fun being forced upon them <laughs> since we got moved out of King's Cross. Um, among the people I know who've lost their jobs are a whole lot of enterprising young people who went out and made their own jobs. They started their own clubs, touring companies, marketing business, um, and if their friend's club goes out of business, then all of the associated businesses go down the toilet with them. And these are people in their 20s, largely, who have bucked the trend of youth unemployment, made a terrific business for themselves, and employed a whole lot of other young people as well. And the state government has just gone and pulled the rug out from under them. If you are... Um, I suspect in this audience there's not many people here who think Richie Florida is, uh, is, is a good source um, for my next comment, but, but given how much energy goes in by government and council to insisting that we have to become a creative economy and a global city and that, that creatives will drive our economic future, I think probably the realistic version of that is that if you want Sydney to be a global city and it's a really long way from the financial markets of Asia, let alone the rest of the world, the reason that the world's brightest talent come to live in Sydney is not because we have the biggest salaries and it's not because we're in the middle of the biggest markets, it's because we have an extraordinary lifestyle here. And if Sydney's no fun, it's going to be very, very hard to recruit internationally for the brightest talent. And I lived in a city in the 80s here in Sydney that we wanted very much to change. We wanted to wake up in a city that never slept. And by a couple of years ago, I'm starting to think we were, we were very much getting that point, especially since the city that never sleeps decided it would go back to sleep and stop everyone from drinking and smoking and having a good time. So just as New York was becoming a snoozeville town, Sydney was really starting to come into its own. And I, for one, think that fighting the good fight on behalf of Sydney here, it, it can be easily mischaracterised as fighting for the right of a bunch of 20-year-olds to get drunk enough to throw up in a gutter in King's Cross at 2 a.m. You have to see past that. Um, because the way the cultural life of a city um, can't just be what's happening at the Opera House. In the end, the rhythm and pace of the city is defined by the amount of fun that it can have after hours. And the rhythm and pace of a city like Sydney is absolutely affected by the extent to which we are allowed to party as hard as we can. Um, and I, for one, applaud the Taxpayers' Alliance and My Choice Australia for being really one of the surprisingly small number of people and organisations who's got behind this. Um, aside from all of the rhetoric coming out of the creative industries and the council and government, it's really um, been a small number of clubs themselves through our Late Night Culture Alliance and the efforts of these guys that have kept this issue on the map. Sadly, I think we'll get change when enough people go broke. Um, I hope that doesn't have to happen. And so thank you to everyone who's come here tonight. Um, Tim's asked me to say one or two words briefly. This is such a shameless plug. I, I don't want to present slightly as if I've been begged to make this utterly shameless plug. Um, this is my new book, 10 Good Reasons to Relax and Let Kids Be Kids. Um, one of the things that I despise most of all about the nanny state is that people keep inventing fake reasons to worry about other people. Um, I think the next two speakers will deal with that in detail. I tell you what doesn't kill kids in this country is trampolines, boxing, <laughs> walking to school. Um, what possibly will kill kids in the long run is sitting on their asses till they get diabetes. Um, and possibly at the point that the zombie apocalypse comes, or possibly, you know, <laughs> General Peter Lay's hundred year war with ISIS, or any number of just garden variety adult challenges that require you not to be a complete and utter wuss. The way that we are raising our kids now, infantilizing them to the point where you think, will any of them have the guts to start their own business? Will they have the guts to fight the government when the government tries to take away their freedom? Will they have the courage to begin 40 or 50 extraordinary community campaigns against every kind of statist oppression that I can think of? I don't think we're going to produce too many Lauras if we raise our kids to be afraid to walk to school, afraid to get on a horse, afraid to play football. We've seen in this state alone the banning of running games, chasing games, um, Brisbane schools banned British Bulldog and encouraged their kids to play board games instead. There were schools in Melbourne that banned football on school grounds. 
We had Queensland schools banning elastics. Now, we're getting to a point now where it's not surprising that an adult, that a grown adult can say, the thing I think is the most important thing is to have a preventative health agency take proper care of me. If we raise children who don't even think that they're able to walk down the shops and get milk by themselves without being assaulted and terrorised by pedophile rapists, you know, there is far too much panicking about things which don't matter. And any one of the leading causes of fear about kids, whether it's abduction, kidnapping, drowning, shark attack, death by rugby injury, none of those things are as common as dying from elevator-related injuries. Um, so if you do fancy checking the facts, if you know any paranoid people with kids, uh, everything that's less dangerous than riding an elevator is documented in here. And uh, thank you again, Tim, for giving me the opportunity to talk about how important it is to let our kids hurt themselves more often. <laughs> Thank you, Cass. Um, we actually have a copy of Cass's book to give away, and we haven't really decided on the mechanism, so I think I'm going to autocratically dictate that whoever buys me the best drink after everyone's done speaking will get the book. To freedom! To freedom. So that is something to look forward to. Freedom is not free, it costs a nice drink for Lara. Um, really want to thank Cass for mentioning um, My Choice's work against the lockouts. We've been running the I'm Not the Problem campaign, which has tried to focus on the fact that most people have been punished by the lockouts, despite the fact that 99.9% .9 of people can go out, get as trashed as they like, go wherever they want in the CBD or the cross and not coward punch someone, uh, because shockingly it's really easy not to be a violent dickhead. Um, <laughs> but as it turns out, the state doesn't mention that, and so that's why we have to fight. Um, and I'm also really glad that Cass talked about the impact that the cumulative impact of the policies that we that the, poli the policies that we oppose at My Choice Australia, the nanny state policies, which is raising a generation of muted fearful people and it's something that I think that whilst it might seem like a worst case scenario is certainly a worst case scenario that we want to avoid and so I want to thank everyone again for coming out tonight um, and now we move on to Julie. Thank you very much. I very much uh, appreciate that. I um, appreciate the opportunity uh, uh, to, to speak at the this ATA event and My Choice event and especially um, after a most uh, spirited uh, speech by Cass Wilkinson um, concerning, among other things, uh, the deleterious impact of paternalism upon the live music industry, which is one of the most basic and direct expressions of human creativity. So, uh, if I might sort of start off by sort of uh, talking about um, pre-Keynesian public finance uh, as a lead-in to taxation implications of um, the nanny state. So a reading of uh, pre-Keynesian public finance works would impart the reasonably consistent message that taxation should be imposed for revenue raising purposes only, or to paraphrase Adam Smith, to defray the costs of public works and for that purpose alone. Um, for most modern practical purposes, however, adherence to uh, this principle has been drastically um, compromised. Theoretical developments in economics and sociology, along with the perennial incentives of political agents to commandeer power over more aspects of living, have equipped policymakers with inspiration to enact taxes for all sorts of additional reasons. Now, these might include private income equalisation, the promotion of domestic versus foreign industries, the salvation of local, national and global environments, and of course, a long-standing tradition in the Australian context, quelling the consumption of lifestyle products such as alcohol, food and tobacco, the good stuff, essentially. Um, so this last rationale for taxation by modern government, that is, the imposition of taxes to, to deter, certain lifestyle choices is, to my mind at least, perhaps one of the more conspicuous oddities, perhaps even policy hypocrisies um, in the modern realm. Why? Well, the reason why is because lifestyle taxes are trumped by their many proponents, more often than not through their own works, academic works included, financed by compulsory taxation, 
on the basis of improving public health. Now, as an aside, the modern deployment of that term, public health, is one of the more egregious semantic abuses, I think, of our times. Put that aside. But contrasting, in fact, that publicly stated rationale for lifestyle taxes as a strategy to promote health, right, they are, in fact, um, designed to boost revenue. And so, in a very odd manner, uh, reinforcing, at first glance, the very traditional rationale for taxation, which is revenue raising. But, but, but not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Because lifestyle taxes do not represent the mere defraying of the costs of government and nothing more, but actually represent overtaxation. Now, even the most rationally ignorant voter is probably rather aware of the fact about modern public finances, one aspect of it, I should say, than anything else. And that is the amount of revenue raised in lifestyle taxes vastly, vastly exceed the most generous, boosterish estimates of the fiscal burdens of alcohol, food and tobacco consumption on governmentally financed health regimes. Okay? And when the rampant socialism of overtaxation butts against the head of liberty in the form of exercising one's own lifestyle choices as we've done quite uh, meritoriously tonight, and that actually caused no harm to others, um, it is usually the least political influential among us in our community that get hurt the most. And what I mean by that is that the poorer among us in our community tend to be the politically voice voiceless and thus it comes as no surprise, to me at least, that those on lower incomes tend to bear the brunt of lifestyle taxes. Now, you don't have to actually take this voluntarist liberal's word for it uh, to inspect official statistics produced uh, by the Australian government itself to illustrate that lifestyle taxes represent a drain upon the wallets of the poor. In 2009-10, the lowest 20% of income earning households paid out about 6.4% of their disposable incomes in the form of taxes on alcohol, food and tobacco. Far too much, obviously. But conversely, the highest 20% only paid about 2.2%. So in other words, what I'm saying here is that the poorest in Australia are on average basically paying three times as much in lifestyle taxes as the rich, even so-called cigar-chomping federal treasurer, for example. <laughs> okay. And it's really what I'm saying here is that it's really the poorest among us who fiscally cop it in the neck. Okay, thanks to lifestyle taxes, which are paternalistically imposed upon them and the rest of us by the political class, with the willing aiding and abetting of nannying academics, for example, and, and non-health qualifying, self-appointed public um, health academics as well. And I think it's, it's difficult enough being poor in this country, even in a modern Australia where the average where the living standards, even among the poorest among us, vastly exceed uh, those of monarchs in the Middle Ages. That, that is true, that's to be fair. But still, it's, it is difficult uh, to live a financially meagre existence. The excessive pa tax penalty for wanting to enjoy a beer at the pub with mates, a quiet reflective ciggy, or a cheap yet cheerful hamburger or pie, fills the stomach, only adds to the burdens of poor face. And all for nothing other than giving politicians, and there are many hangers on in my view, the smug satis satisfaction of lording it over others. And this is why I think the only credible and moral proposition when it comes to taxation policy is this. Let's all work together to radically reduce the burdens of over taxation, which much, with much, much, much lower lifestyle taxes being the starting point. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shamelessly take this occasion to promote our campaign against the alcohol tax, which is, in my view, uh, and in my choice Australia's view, the worst possible lifestyle tax that could have been applied, because we can prove empirically that it was designed to solve a problem, and it has exacerbated that problem. Whereas 
unfortunately, most lifestyle packs are simply create new problems instead of exacerbating the ones they're designed to solve. Um, so in order to keep it short and keep moving on, let's welcome Chris Merton. Good evening, comrades. How are you? Um, it's very nice to be invited to this. It's very nice to be in Australia. Um, thank you for putting on some British weather for me. Feel very good. Good summery August weather, where I come from. Um, yeah, no, I, I haven't been here for eight years, and I'd forgotten, actually, sorry, I'd forgotten how much I, I really do love it here, and you wouldn't guess that from some of the things I've written about Australia uh, in the last few years, which I emphasise more about the Australian government and uh, a one or two people, such as the narcissistic douchebag, Sam Chapman, uh, these, <laughs> these parts, and, and various other people. Um, I'm glad to see things uh, in a very small number of respects uh, have improved. You know, new Human Rights Commission, for example, um, the closure of the, uh, whatever it's called, Australian Preventative Health Agency, uh, are a couple of small, tiny steps in the right direction. Um, and, you know, any criticism, um, you know, from a Brit about the nanny state in Australia is really just the narcissism of minor differences. I mean, there is very, very little between um, most of the Anglophone countries when it comes to this kind of stuff. They're all chasing to be the world leader in, uh, in harassing drinkers or smokers or people who eat food. Um, and, um, I mean, to give you some examples of that, in, in Britain, in the last year or so, I, I off the top of my head, I, I listed a number of so-called public health policies that um, have been proposed, if not actually enacted. Uh, I don't think you've got many of these. Uh, minimum pricing for alcohol, plain packaging for tobacco, a 20% tax on fizzy, you got that one yet? I heard about that. A 20% tax on fizzy drinks, a fat tax, a sugar tax, a fine for not being a member of a gym. <laughs> Graphic warnings on those in the New England Medical Journal, not some, you know, crackpot organisation. Um, graphic warnings on alcohol, attacks on certain foods, subsidies for other foods, a ban on the sale of hot food to children before 5pm, good British one, a ban on anyone born after the year 2000 ever buying tobacco, a ban on multi-bag packs of crisps, chips you call them I think, a ban on packed lunches in schools, a complete ban on alcohol advertising, a ban on electric, electronic cigarettes, which you more or less have, a ban on menthol cigarettes, a ban on large servings of fizzy drinks, a ban on parents taking their kids to school by car, and a ban on advertising any product whatsoever to children. The most recent one, um, a couple of weeks ago, was if you're in a supermarket and um, you buy too many products with salt or sugar or fat, you get a little warning on your receipt. A little bespoke warning, saying, you know, maybe you should uh, lose some weight, you fat bastards, or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's hard to imagine, and yet true, that many of these proposals are proposed by people who would probably define themselves as being liberals. And we should only hope that they never lurch towards authoritarianism or, authoritarianism or express an interest in, in fascism. I was only just before I came out, I saw some story on, on one of the news channels about um, the horror, the moral panic of preloading, of people, grown adult human beings, drinking alcohol in their own homes. Uh, before going elsewhere to buy very expensive drinks. I mean, this is, you, it shows how you can't win with these people. The, the, the unintended consequence of making alcohol incredibly expensive, both through alcohol taxes and a ridiculously high minimum wage at the weekend, and various other pieces of regulation, was so obviously going to lead to more people drinking at home. That can anyone really not have expected this? Um, these guys in this news report were going around people in Sydney uh, these preloaders and asking various questions and taking down the the, the, um, the answers on an iPad, but also breathalyzing them to see how much they've drunk before they before they go out. And they, they, it was unexpressed in the news item, but this is just it's a, it's going to be a study. It's going to be appear in some crappy journal, and it's all there entirely to support the ongoing campaign for minimum pricing. That's what anything to do with preloading, as you probably realise, is actually about minimum pricing. That's what the that's what the ultimate policy. It's going to be. There was even the, the lead researcher on this was complaining that um, people now 
are so keen on, on staying fit and trim that they go for the biceps and the triceps. And this means because they have less fat, then they get drunk more quickly. And this is a real co cause for concern. <laughs> the, the government needs to, needs to do something about this. You really cannot win. If you, if you, if you get scared by the obesity panic, then you just get, you know, you're, you're then a target for the, for the alcohol panic. <laughs> Um, and you know, more to the point, what the fuck has it got to do with the government? Whether uh, you know, grown adults are drinking at home or drinking in the bars, what is, how is it possibly their business? Yeah, yeah. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the original prohibitionist movement in America, um, which obviously succeeded in, in getting alcohol banned for 14 years, they were called the anti-saloon league. Okay, that gives you a clue as to what their real target was. They were concerned about people going to the saloons, going to the pubs, coming back, beating their wives or whatever, coming back with no money to feed the kids. You know, all these you know, kind of legitimate concerns. They didn't, even the prohibitionists didn't really care about people drinking in their own home, even if they went out afterwards. It's a complete nonsense. The, the, the only thing these kind of people care about is where are people drinking? If, if there's more people drinking in the pubs, they'll go after the pub. If there's more people drinking um, on, you know, from bottle shops and supermarkets, they'll go after them. There is no uh, logical cohesion to any of this, except for we don't like alcohol and we want to stamp it out. Doesn't matter if alcohol consumption is going up, as it is hardly anywhere. Doesn't matter if it's flat, as it is in Australia. Doesn't matter if it's going down quite sharply, as it is in, in Britain. Um, the, 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 the scares and the same old policies will um, will be fought for in, in either case. One of the things I really like about Australia, it's not in my top 10, but it, it, it is there, is the use of a word that, that you use a fair bit, uh, I think you used to use more than you do now perhaps, we never used as far as I know in England, and that is the word wowsers. It's a, it's a fantastic word that needs to be brought back in a bigger way, it needs to be introduced to the rest of the world. There is something about the word, I don't know where it's derived from, I don't even strictly know what the definition of, but there's something about it, it's almost onomatopoeic, and it describes the kind of people um, who we're, we're dealing with. It's better, I think, than a term like nanny state, which, yeah, it's good insofar as it, it, it suggests that the government is treating people like children, which of course they are. It's better than something like paternalism, which has the same kind of meaning, but both of them suggest that actually these people have your interests um, at heart. And I don't think they do. I don't think they care about you whatsoever. I just think they are wowzers. I think they are they're fanatics. And uh, they're full of contempt for almost everybody involved. You know, the, 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 sometimes they talk about stakeholders and stakeholder engagement and all this kind of thing. The, let's be clear about this. The only stakeholder in a transaction between a company and the customer, be it tobacco, alcohol, or hamburgers, is the company and the customer, right? They're the only people who matter at all. Just hating one of these products does not make you a, a stakeholder. It just makes you a curtain twitching, you know, uh, imbecile who needs to focus on their own life. You don't become a stakeholder just by being obsessed by something. Um, but that's by the by. The lifestyle economics that we do at the Institute of Economic Affairs um, is essentially the, the study of wowsers. And all my writing career, I have. Um, I've been fascinated by the by the wowsers. You know, I wrote a book about um, about smoking a few years ago, but it was actually the history of anti-smoking. It was looking at the people who were trying to get rid of these things because I cannot understand why anybody would dedicate their lives to trying to stop somebody else doing something uh, that, that they would want to do. And the lifestyle economics, the economics part of it, um, primarily comes from trying to bring some economic logic and reasoning uh, to uh, you know to, to apply to these. Um, these campaigns, primarily costs and benefits and trade-offs, right? The most fundamental things possibly in economics, that there are no solutions in economics, there are only trade-offs. You can do something, but there will be consequences from that. You can, you can get benefits from something, but there are going to be costs from them. And uh, Julie's already you know, uh, hinted at this, but the, um, the idea that people uh, dying younger, I mean, to just be blunt about it, people dying younger is a cost to the government, is simply untrue. Uh, and even if it um, were not untrue, there are still costs in terms of what people want to do, a loss of utility, as you would put it. Um, and the fanatics, the wowsers, never see the costs and benefits because they have total tunnel vision. They really don't think they matter. You know, it doesn't matter how many pubs might close down as a result of the smoking ban. It doesn't matter how um, much loneliness someone might face as a result of no longer going to the pub as a, uh, as a result of the smoking ban. Don't even see the very clear and financial costs of putting tax up on, on alcohol or taxing fizzy drinks. All that matters is some theoretical saving of lives based on a 
hopelessly um, biased uh, computer model, which seems to um, be the basis of a lot of the so-called evidence uh, for these policies. I'll give you an example. I'm going to New Zealand tomorrow to talk about how uh, they're thinking about bringing the sugars out. And their computer model has suggested that it will save 67 lives a year from God knows what, a bit of diabetes or something, or the heart disease or something. 67 lives a year in New Zealand, um, and it will raise $40 million. Can you see the trick? Can you see the sophistry in that? It's a win-win. It will raise $40 million, and it will save 67 lives. Actually, what that means is the cost of the policy is $40 million. <laughs> the savings will be, and it won't be this anyway, because they, they never write these computer models. They're never anywhere near it. I'd be surprised if it saves a single life. But it, in theory, the saving is 67 lives. So you're costing that out as being well over half a million dollars to save each life. Now, you could, with that money, which you're taking from taxpayers, you could offer 40,000 people $1,000 each to lose weight and give them, give them money if they do that. I'm pretty sure you would get a better return for your money from getting 40,000 people to lose weight than you would from just hiking up the, the price of a, a can of Coke. But if you did that, I suspect that most taxpayers would think, hang on, I don't want my money spent on bribing fat people to, to lose weight. It's nothing to do with me. But it's exactly the same thing as being proposed. You just need to look at it in the right way. It's not raising money. If, if raising money for the government is a good thing, we'd give them all our money. It's a, a terrible thing, giving the government your money. Um, and then they, they bring in intangible costs and so on, you know, the, the, uh, they, they never look at intangible benefits, but they look at intangible costs. So the, uh, you know, if I die at the age of 67 and I lose 12 years of life, then there's a cost to me of millions, of, millions of, uh, of pounds or dollars, because my, each life year is valued at $100,000. This is seriously how they look at these things. And they will claim that then is a cost to the taxpayer. My, my early death is, is, it costs me, who is already dead, so it doesn't matter, <laughs> $1.2 million. We'll, we'll pretend that's a cost to the taxpayer. We'll have everyone who's going to die young because of tobacco and hamburgers and whatever. And we say the cost of the taxpayer is $45 billion. And I know they've done this on a quite heroic scale in, in Australia. Um, Eric Crampton's written some really good stuff about this. Just unbelievable costs they come up with. The opportunity cost of having to taxi somebody home from a party. Value it, you know, two thousand dollars or whatever. The the emotional cost of seeing vomit in the street. Seriously, these are seriously things. I mean, I can list them all. They're, they're, they're unbelievable emotional costs, intangible costs of being annoyed. The opportunity cost of having to phone the police to report some drunken vandalism. All this utter nonsense. All entirely designed to get the biggest possible figure, and in particular to make sure the figure is higher than the alcohol duty, which is increasingly a struggle as the alcohol duty keeps going up. But they will never look at the intangible benefits or even the financial benefits of any of these habits. The Food and Drug Administration in America recently, and I don't know why they did this, it's amazing, um, because they did something that's actually useful and, and true, um, and, but it doesn't help their campaign against, um, against smoking, is they said that if we reduce smoking by such and such a percentage, we need to accept that this will mean that people, you know, fewer people will get the pleasure of smoking. It's utter heresy. You can't say that. And, and, you know, that anyone enjoy, the idea that anyone enjoys smoking is un unsayable, if not unthinkable. People only smoke because of peer pressure when they're young, and packaging, of course, and, um, and, and, and stick with it because they're addicted. There's no other reason. Every, uh, you know, every smoke, every cigarette smoked, um, gives people no increase in utility at all. It's a total mystery why a billion people around the world do it. Um, but they, yeah, they said it, but that's extremely rare. The, uh, the actual benefits, intangible, emotional, even financial benefits of any of these so-called bad habits um, can never be brought into play because of the tunnel vision of the wowsers. Um, so they ignore, they, they ignore all sorts of costs. The tunnel vision's quite deliberate. Um, and they do this because they think that health, or to be more accurate, longevity, is the most important thing in life. Uh, a lot of this stuff has really got nothing to do with health. Public health has got nothing to do with health, certainly, but health is not a public good, and you know, harassing people and banning packaging and banning advertising doesn't make any difference to health in the first place. It's, not a, it's nothing to do with health. Half the people involved in it um, have got no, no qualifications in health. A lot of them have got qualifications in things like sociology. A lot of them are political <laughs> campaigners. A lot of them are anti-capitalists. Um, but it's got very, very little, indeed, uh, to do with health. But there is still this obsession with, not health, but I would say longevity, of measuring your success by how many months you can increase the, the nation's life expectancy. And there is, you know, the mandarins of public health never explain, have, have never explained, 
why is it why it's more desirable to live to the age of 85 um, living a very bare and aesthetic existence rather than living a life of gluttony and fun to the age of 75. Most of us, I think, most of us, I think, would rather live to the age of 70 than the age of 60. Whether I would like to live to the age of 100 than 90 is more of a moot point. Certainly, if it meant I had to be deprived of all my pleasures, I'd absolutely be happy to die at 90. In fact, I'll raise you to 80. Um, and I think most people do. Most people, you know, inherently understand that there is a trade-off, that we will all die, and I'm afraid to say probably die in pain, and so it's only a matter of whether you think those last five years of life are really so uh, worth fighting for that you'll deny yourself in the prime of your life. Um, I will close by saying um, something. I, 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 uh, I'm, this is my fourth talk in the last five days. I'm a little bit um, <laughs> sketchy. Is that, yeah, there, there is something, I think, um, profoundly unhealthy about this fixation with longevity. Um, you know, the, its flip side is a sort of morbid obsession with images of death and disease that you now see on, on cigarette packs and, and we'll soon, soon see, I'm sure, on wine bottles, um, which is almost medieval, almost, uh, if you're familiar with medieval death culture, it has that uh, ring to it, making everything miserable, everything, everything morbid, um, and sucking all the, all the joy out of life. Um, and at least the peasants of the Middle Ages uh, at least it actually did have death around the corner. You know, there was a very, there was a very real reason why they were obsessed with death and skeletons and the plague. It's because they, they literally could be, you know, alive and healthy one day and struck down tomorrow. That's not the case, um, at least for the countries not struck by Ebola at the moment. For us, um, we have probably more to worry about what we're going to do uh, in extreme, extreme old age. And um, sorry, I just put it up to the top. I think that the, the Wowsers, you know, the modern Puritans, instead of being given the inexplicable respect that they seem to be given by politicians in the media, should be seen as, as what they are. You know, a hundred years ago it was very easy to see where people were coming from. If they're coming out of the Methodist church with a placard saying, you know, no more gin, you knew you were dealing, you knew you were dealing with, with prohibitionists. They, they made some effort to claim it was about health to some extent, but really, the, yeah, they knew, and we knew, everybody knew, that this was a moral crusade. And these days it's not quite so obvious. And um, you know, we, we find it easy to ridicule the pointy-headed pointy Puritans of previous generations. Um, and we remain peculiarly short-sighted when it comes to uh, the, the prohibitionists and the scolds among us today. But once we identify them, and they are not, when it comes down to it, so difficult to identify, we should treat them with the same derision and scorn, and indeed denormalization, a great word of public health. We, we must be denormalized, <laughs> as, as must the products we consume. Let's demonize them, let's uh, denormalize them, and um, you know, anybody who, for example, uses a afraid big food, uh, in, in relation to anything that is not a large serving of food, should be treated like the dunce that they are. Um, they, 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 <laughs> anyone who uses such terms without irony should be treated with a mixture of pity and contempt. Uh, people who should not be humoured. Uh, those who go beyond the childish rhetoric and call for force of law to be directed at people for their own good should be viewed as the antisocial menaces that they are. Uh, ostracized at civilized gatherings, uh, Pope fun ass whenever seen. And the syntaxes that they so often call for in, in increasing number of areas should also be seen as what they are, extortion based on prejudice. Lifestyle fines, essentially, uh, is, is what they are. Not taxes in any meaningful way. Certainly minimum pricing is not a tax. It doesn't even go to the government, which is perhaps why it's been one of the few nanny state measures to be rejected so far by the <laughs> British government. Um, and finally, the issue of risk needs to be viewed from the right end of the telescope. In a society in which everybody on a daily basis willing, willingly puts themselves at some level of risk in return for some level of benefit, those who attempt to lead lives of ascetic self-denial um, should be regarded as curious outliers. Their, you know, their, their, their choice to put longevity before anything else should be respected. Um, but the moment they try and... Um, force everybody else to pursue extreme longevity at great, great cost to their enjoyment of life um, and make any attempt to bully and cajole us into doing so, uh, we should say enough is enough. Get out. We're having no more of it. Thank you.
Chris. Um, I think it's really useful and really important to have a representative from Fort Crime Island, <clears throat> sorry the UK, um, <laughs> to show us what it is that we're fighting against and what our world could look like. I mean, Chris lives in my personal version of hell, which is a world without menthol cigarettes. And that's something that I want to never see happen to this country. Um, so again, yeah, 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 the European Tobacco <laughs> Products <laughs> Directive, I think it's the TPP. Not for another nine years, we've still gone for now. Helmut Schmidt, nine years, Helmut that's, Schmidt, that's the former German Chancellor. Uh, is a huge smoker of cigarettes, and specifically menthol cigarettes. He's already 93, Champagne. I think. And when he yeah. heard that the European Union was going to ban them, he bought enough cigarettes, to, uh, menthol cigarettes, to last him for the next eight years. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they, when they brought in the law, they they negotiated essentially with the tobacco industry and said, okay, we'll give you um, we'll, we'll give you a, a delay, a period of uh, delay. So they're only going to bring it in 2021, by which time how much we might just about got to the last carton of cigarettes, but it'll be about 102. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's have another round of applause for all of our fantastic speakers. Tonight. Um, so I hope everyone's going to leave here tonight with a stronger understanding of the many and varied ways that the state has found to poke you and prod you into the direction that they want you to live. Um, the awful ways that they get in the way of you living your life, pursuing your happiness. Um, and I think it's really important that we have night, nights like this where we come together and review the lie of the land um, and learn about policies that we may not have realized affected us or the extent to which the policies we know about affect us. Because this is our everyday life we're talking about. This is our freedom. And the fight against the enemy state is never ending. Um, and we can never let our guard down for a second. So I really appreciate everyone turning out tonight and supporting My Choice Australia, supporting our events and supporting our campaigns. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, we've still got the room for another couple of hours, I think. So drink up, have a fantastic time, avail yourself of the upstairs and downstairs bars. Uh, Glenn? What comes next? What comes next? Donate to the ATA! Yeah, give us money. <laughs> That's what comes next. What comes next is the transfer of finances, and then we apply those finances towards freedom activities. <laughs> you can make online donations here tonight for this great cause. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also make them to Rachel Wildall, who is the Buy illegal cigarettes this evening. Room, and you can make donations no, 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 in the form of purchasing me drinks, which would go towards potentially winning a copy of Cass's fantastic book about why everything is actually okay in this country and you don't have to be afraid of every single person who ever existed. Did we have Ask him about that. Hmm? This criminal government. Um, James, I think that's a question you can ask afterwards. So thank you everyone so much for listening to our speakers tonight. If you've got any questions, direct them towards them personally and hopefully we'll um, have some enjoyable drinks. I'll see you next time.